Up today, we are going to be speaking with Rich Kleiman, partner and founder of 35 Ventures, longtime business partner of NBA star Kevin Durant, and longtime pal of yours truly. Rich, thanks so much for joining. Uh, I've been following your podcast forever, and it's kind of cool now to see you on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, yes. But thanks for taking the time. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. And I'm so used to, like you said, sitting in this seat recording my pod on Zoom over the last two years that it's nice to uh, turn the camera around on you for a second. And exactly. Make- Kick back a little bit. Yeah. So we're going to start by getting to know you uh, a little bit for those of you who don't know as much about you. Um, you went from being a producer, music supervisor, for almost a decade to co-founding 35 Ventures. And you know, you've had, an, I think, a meteoric rise. It's been amazing to see as a friend. But tell us a little bit about your career journey. I'd love to hear just how you got to where you are today. Yeah, um, well, as a kid, I, I was instantly kind of obsessed with like the culture around sports and the music business and the film business. And it wasn't as much that I necessarily dreamt of being an athlete, which I did as a young kid. But as I got a bit older, I had enough knowledge of sports to know that I wasn't going to play professional sports. But in the same way, I didn't want to be uh, an artist or an actor. But the energy around all of those kind of um, fields were exciting to me. I remember yeah. being at basketball games as a kid and um, beyond being obsessed with the game, I really always wanted to know like who the hell got those front row seats, you know, because it wasn't celebs when we were kids. It was always like powerful media moguls and it was always fascinating to think that like, holy shit, from your work, you can go get that seat. And seeing like the interaction between everyone on the floor and all that energy was something that I really always like just craved. I loved it. And I did pretty well in school as a kid. I went to college. I didn't focus in college, as you know, since we went to BU together. But yeah. I always had a very entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, it manifested in being a bookie in college also, as you know. But I think I still owe you some money, but hopefully yeah, that's fine. You may, you may. <laughs> um, but as soon as I left school um, prematurely, I definitely loved the idea of um, having your own business and, and doing something that like people knew you for and you were regarded for. And obviously music, sports, and entertainment where, where I first started. So it was a hustle. I did so many things. I've managed so many artists and producers. I've produced different TV and film. I've music supervised, like you said. Um, And then when I met Jay-Z, it was the first time that I was like, wait, hold up. I do want to be an entrepreneur and build my own thing. But the opportunity to go work for someone who at that point I saw him and I said, man, this is this is the the epitome of everything I've ever craved to be around this like flawlessly cool energy and ability to have this like instinct and know how to make something fresh. And I I really enjoyed my time there as a, a music manager. But when I finally had the opportunity to get back into sports and all my experience through the years clicked. Um, that's really when I started to like get my uh, mojo a bit. Right. And, and, you, and you're talking about when you started to launch Rock Nation Sports under Jay-Z, right? Correct, yes. And because I knew Kevin a little bit from an artist, Wale, that I had managed, he was one of the first calls that we made. And obviously, like everything in life, it's timing. And we yep. caught him at a great point in his career, and we were just building our our agency and he trusted in us and gave us an opportunity and and while i managed a handful of other athletes when i was there i really realized at that point that you know not only was i ultimately going to want to have my own business but i had now met this like friend and um an incredible iconic basketball player that was at the point in his life where like a lot of other peers jay-z lebron people that he had seen build these blueprints around what and now is called the creator economy, but then was, you know, incredible star at the center and all these different revenue streams. I caught Kevin and and he met me both at times when we've said, you know what, it's time to build something that's ours. Yeah. And it's been amazing to see. A couple of questions just to rewind a little bit going through your journey. You you talk about meeting Jay-Z. I mean, not everybody gets to meet Jay-Z. How do you meet somebody like Jay-Z and what's the context behind that? You know, it's funny that you, you ask it that way. I have to be more mindful of some of these things because um, I went to a net game the other day in Boston and I was very fortunate to be able to fly with the owner of the team and also very fortunate to be able to sit on the floor. And I never could have, um, you know, imagined that those kind of luxuries would be afforded to me and be available to me. However, I always did imagine myself being there and that I was going to find a way 
to be there. And you never I doubted it because you weren't always who you were. I mean, I've known you forever. And there were times when, you know, when you weren't as relevant, clearly as you are now, but even yeah. during those times, you know, you always kind of knew. Yeah. Well, so it's, yeah, a hundred percent. And the thing is, is like, I actually am really empowered by it because I wonder if I had had the confidence earlier in my life to break out of whatever insecurity kept me from, let's say, operating at 60% of my potential, um, maybe I wouldn't be where I am now. I wouldn't have the perspective right. that I have now to, to know how incredibly lucky I am to have gotten that access and what I did when I went to Boston. And my friend said, yo, that's insane because I took a friend of mine with me. He was like, "That's this is crazy. We were in New York, now we're in Boston. Right. I was living this and finding my way around this when I had no money. So the fact that I met Jay-Z when I was 25 and I was managing DJs and managing producers, it wasn't that I was super successful or like you said, relevant, but it was that like I was going to find myself in the middle of the action one way or the other. And I think of it as like I played a supporting actor role so much of my life when I was younger. And so that's why you saw me like that. Yeah, in my mind, you're always at the I, clubs, you knew the DJs, you knew the promoters, you knew the yeah. people, you were at the center of it, but you weren't really driving it. You were I just kind of there. Right. Exactly right. And I, but the thing is, is I knew that because yeah. if I didn't know that I would still be at Rock Nation or I'd still be doing what I was doing. Right, right. So that's amazing. And, and when you first met Jay-Z, were you starstruck? Because one thing, you know, about you that I definitely admire is you are yourself no matter who you're around. You're the okay. same way around me as you are around a celebrity or an NBA star or whatever it may be. And that's a trait that you really can't teach people. And did yeah. you always have that? And did you have that when you met Jay-Z for the first time? Yeah, I've always, uh, yeah. I mean, and it's funny because I don't think, uh, um, I don't think about who I'm talking to. Right. I never thought about it in terms of like, I shouldn't be talking to this person or I shouldn't be able to ask this person a question. I was nervous inside, um, but it manifests itself in that, like, I'm just going to be myself. I feel like it's the easiest person to be like, you know, so yep. every time I'm nervous or anxious, I just kind of fall back on the fact that like, I know I can be engaging. And if I just act like myself, it'll work. And to be honest, it didn't work all the time when I was younger. And that is the truth, because I think that what um, a lot of people may gravitate towards when we're younger are different skill sets or different things that while I had them, it wasn't what I emphasized. It wasn't right. Like I wasn't going to be, I, and I partied, I went out, but I wasn't necessarily going to be, you know, seven nights a week or I'm flying all over the world. I got married early. So there was a lot of pacing myself. I wanted to start a family early. And a lot of times growing as an unconventional entrepreneur, I had to say, all right, I'm going to go for the long run here. I'm, I'm going on the marathon because I can't sprint. A, I don't know if it's working. I'm not necessarily getting out the gate as fast as I wanted, but I know I can win this race, but I also want to start a family. So how long can everyone else stay in it? And I think that yeah. has a lot to do with what you see now is that, you know, the one thing is I have been doing this since I was 20 years old. I'm yeah. An, an overnight success decades in the making, right? That's how yeah. it is. I, I was think both of us as parents, you know, it's something that, you know, we definitely need to teach our kids and young people is that just in this world of, of everybody's on Instagram, everyone wants to be rich, famous. Part of that may be them leaning into the short term personality traits that may be getting them ahead short term, but not staying true to who they are. Yeah. And ultimately, I think you're an example of how it can pay off as long as you stick to who you really are over time. Totally. I yeah. Completely. So we're going to get into 35 Ventures um, and the boardroom and all that stuff, but we're going to go to a next segment of the podcast, uh, which we call Culture Watch. Um, so get the stopwatch ready. I ask you four questions that delve deeper to understand what brands, technologies, and trends are driving growth in your perspective. You have 30 seconds to answer each, and then we'll dive deeper in each of them. So the first question is, What's the most important business decision you had to make quickly? March of 2020, when everyone else had to make quick decisions, I realized that even though my business was important to me, that ultimately if I flipped the switch the next day, it could have all went away, that nobody was relying on it. And that it was at the end of the day, me managing Kevin Durant. What I really wanted was an enterprise. And at that point I said, you know what? 
I could flip the switch, but instead I'm doubling down and I'm going to yep. lock in right now and I'm going to build what exactly what I want this thing to be. And, you know, at that point, I think I made the decision to, you know, take advantage of something, no matter what the circumstances in the world were that I've always wanted to do and not be scared by, you know, the landscape of what we were living in. And, you know, that to me was like a real inflection point. And I remember being with you in Southampton the summer prior, we we're having breakfast, you were telling me about your vision for it. And, you know, you were still kind of piecing it together and, you know, it, you had to double down then. And now yeah, obviously it's right. paying off. Um, next question is, what do you think the fastest growing industry is going to be in the next few years? The creator economy. Um, and I think obviously it'll evolve and iterate, but ultimately yeah. the creator economy. What about the fast growing product or product segment? Uh, fastest growing product or product segment. I mean, ultimately I think, you know, it's a very popular answer, but I still would have to say NFTs and in just right. understanding how they'll fit both complementary to, uh, you know, what we already know and the products that we already have come to understand, but how it's going to be in itself an entire economy. Yeah. And I mean, it's popular to you and probably your world, but so many people are still trying to understand it. So eager to dig deeper there. And then lastly, what do you see as the fastest growing consumer trend this year moving into next year? I think playing off of NFTs is that we have originally thought of NFTs as these kind of like worlds within the metaverse that don't make sense and have complete arbitrage. But I do think what you'll start to see now, and it'll make a lot more sense for people, are brands that we do know and brands that we have become accustomed to using their kind of long-standing trust with the consumer, what they have in the physical, and introducing NFTs and introducing the metaverse as a complement to what their brand is existing. And I think that'll then start to clear it up for a lot of consumers. Okay, so let's let's double click on all these things. I definitely see some common themes. So here we are, it's March, 2020, and you were saying, so you had your core business, so to speak. Well, why don't you just lay out what the business pie chart is of Rich Kleiman? What are the things that you focus on? Because you mentioned a few things, so it'd be great to give the audience an idea of the different places where you have your hands. Yeah, so 35V is the parent company. We renamed it as Not to Confuse Ventures, which is also a vertical of the business. So 35V is the parent company that Kevin and I own. That's your umbrella. That's our umbrella. We have a venture fund of investments that have been invested by Kevin as well as the company, and they all live on the balance sheet of Parent Co. Including right? Susie, I might add. Including Susie, one of yes. our favorites. <laughs> we also have um, a platform in the middle of it because what I realized as we started investing and we started becoming what we wanted to be referred as as a strategic investor, I wanted to prove value. I didn't want to just call myself a strategic investor. So I offered up our extensive network. I helped with positioning and promotion and marketing, but the storytelling I could not do without my own voice, my own platform. So. I looked at the landscape, digital media was as saturated as it got, but the one thing that will never not work is something that's credible and real, and that is like represent, represented of the person creating it. And that to me is why I'm excited about the creator economy. And what Boardroom was, was it really embodied what Kevin and I had done to that point in our life, what we were seeing and where the world was going. And I thought like the culture in and around sports, similar to what Hypebeast and Complex did in hip hop and in streetwear culture, was becoming something that most people didn't realize was truly moving the needle, was what was moving the money in sports. So we really wanted to create that platform to sit at the center, to be, you know, a real like uh, a real voice to what our venture company funds, uh, companies were doing, the movies and TV shows we were making, the, the professional sports teams we were investing, all of it needed storytelling and a narrative and creation. So Boardroom became that. And now we're storytelling and creating and partnering with every athlete and musician and business leader. And um, that sits at the center. And then there's a handful of other strategic partnerships and investments as, as well as obviously managing Kevin's business. And it all sits under 35 V. But I think the flywheel that we've created of platform as a resource to our venture fund, venture fund as information and visibility to continue to build our platform has worked. And now companies like Coinbase or Dapper Labs, who we had invested in have matured and now investing back in our platform. Um, and in what we're building. It's amazing. Yeah, it's been pretty And cool. so, so in March 2020, you were saying, I mean, the world was so uncertain. And so the decision you had to make, if I'm repeating you correctly, is do I focus on really managing Kevin and his business versus going into this somewhat unknown entity when people are saying that we're going to be heading a Great Depression and ad dollars are going to dry up and 
Is that sort of what you were balancing? And how did you ultimately have the confidence to make the decision to double down on boardroom? Um, <laughs> well, I, I looked at my business and I said, okay, what is guaranteed here? Kevin Durant is one of the most iconic athletes and people I've ever been around and one of the most iconic bass players we've ever seen. And he has his own, his own way. He's not LeBron James. He's not Michael Jordan. And there was something beautiful in knowing that I had this unique one of one athlete who trusted me implicitly. I was building his foundation. We were investing in technology. We were working on certain films, certain commercials, and I managed him. So that meant his contract on the court. That's a beautiful business. That's something I could have done for the next 10 years. And, sure. and I could have potentially added on other athletes and maybe created a certain model. Maybe I could have just been a sports agent or manager, but I knew that what I needed to do and what I wanted to do was to be creative and be entrepreneurial and build an enterprise and something that encompassed both of our skill sets and both of our experiences. But you can't get delusioned into thinking that an Instagram page or you know, a repost here and there makes something real. So at that very point, I had to look hard at like, what are we? And what I meant by turning off the lights is you have to say to yourself, is there real value in what we're building here? Because if there's not, don't be scared by it, but now let's build this real value and let's figure out what it is that we've, we've started here and what it is we want it to be. But at that point, I could have said, you know what? The safe thing is, let me not increase payroll. Let me not hire more and more people. Let me not invest in content. Let me not roll the dice on covering NFTs and collectibles. And let me just cut my overhead, streamline my life. Yeah, be more, play more defense and offense, basically. And, and be a manager and agent. Yep. The problem is, is the best part of my relationship with Kevin is he doesn't love to do brand deals. So it, it really showed me that the only way we were going to build enterprise value was to build enterprise value. Right. So at that time, I said, all right, you know what? We're going for it. And, you know, by going for it, there was weeks and weeks and months where it just means we're going for it. No one else really cares. And that yep. part during the pandemic would have been really demoralizing, especially when I knew I had a safe bet here. But ultimately, I really, you know, this is what I love to do, man. I wanted, I want this. So, you know, that was the inflection point. It was like, you know, I admired the guy who owned the stationery store on my block or the hot dog stand because it was theirs. The money yeah. that came to them was theirs. They worked for it. They had a product. They gave it to someone else and the person gave them money. And I'm fascinated by it. So I was like, this isn't enough. I got to build something. And, you know, I think we caught an incredible time in the world. And I had those I had that network. So while the NFT world was starting to take shape and while crypto was starting to become so much more of a mainstream conversation, I had been in this world. I understood it. And I said, well, the one thing I'm going to do is instead of trying to chase it all and keep up with it, I'm going to cover it. I'm going to be the one source that covers it all and threw ourselves in it. And I think that really helped to start to define what we were building. Yeah. And you talk about the, the creator economy and how you think it's going to continue to grow. And obviously, that's a byproduct of this this continued decentralization of media, where now everybody has a voice. When we were growing up, there were three channels on TV. Uh, you could only listen to the music that was played in heavy rotation on Hot 97 or one of a handful of, of radio stations. And now you can get content from anywhere, music from anywhere. In some ways, it's almost too much. But what we've seen happening, and I know that you guys have made several investments um, in this space, is the top creators are really starting to build, and you, you are, I, I think, included in that, you know, audiences that are starting to become, uh, you know, in demand and enviable of what only traditional media companies used to have. Why do you think the creator economy is going to continue to grow? And, and what do you think brands should be looking at when thinking about how to sort of use the creator economy to propel their business? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the creator economy will continue to grow because of the access and because of the technology and because of the evolution, because of the honesty of Web3, because of the accountability of Web3, there will be a real reliance on a community that's in demand, a community that is like dedicated solely to the voice of the creator. And the problem right. is, is that when we're so saturated with content and choices, we still ultimately can only consume so much yep. that there's a belief and a trust in a particular brand, in a particular individual. You know, the creator economy is brand. It's not as much just individual. It's a certain creator, creative, an entity that has a voice in a community that they can galvanize and give them exclusive experience and exclusive 
um, assets and exclusive, whatever that may be, that they will feel pride in. And I think that what you can't get from web two and web one is that ability to take from your community. And I think that ultimately is why the creator economy will prevail because you can continue to understand your, your audience and continue to give them what they want. And in general, we were never given a hundred percent of what we wanted before. And now yeah. we can be. And going back to Jay-Z, you know, he said, I'm not a businessman, I'm a businessman. I mean, that's basically what it's all yeah. about, right? It's about the power of the personal brand. Yeah. And, hip, and hip, No, I was just gonna say that's, I mean, hip hop to me were the first creators, you know, the yep. first creator economy. It was Puff Daddy, Dr. Dre, Jay-Z. I make music and in and around music, I distribute alcohol, clothing, film, TV. And this was in 1998, yep, they reinvented it. Fat Farm, Russell Simmons, that was the creator economy. Absolutely. So now we're in a world and moving on to the next section of NFTs where not only, you know, I had Sophia Hernandez who heads business marketing and TikTok and going to what you were saying in terms of pe people being able to leverage their personal brands. She's saying one of the biggest things you're seeing on TikTok is this kind of community driven commerce where basically you have a creator, they have a huge audience and they're interacting with their audience and then they're starting to slot in products that they're selling. Um, and so you're seeing that kind of take place in more the traditional e-commerce sense. But now you have this whole world of NFT where essentially somebody can mint or license memorabilia, collectibles, tokens for access, et cetera, into a digital token that you can buy and yeah. use with things. And I think a lot of people think about NFTs. The reason why people write it off is because they look at, oh, why can't I just screenshot that JPEG? And we've heard that a million times. Why are NFTs more than just a JPEG that you can screenshot? Yeah, I mean, I think like, uh, I confuse people sometimes when I answer it this way, but if you really tried to unravel the things that we've come to uh, accept in the physical, you could, you could, your mind could go crazy. Like, yep. Why? Why? I went to the Basquiat um, exhibit yesterday and it was mind blowing. It was incredible. But when you walk around with your eight year old and your eight year old says to you, I could draw that, right? And I say, ah, I know, but you need to understand what he was saying, what he made it with, the time that it was, who he was, and now you understand the value. Right. That's very hard to understand at eight. It's really hard to understand for some people ever. How right. is this piece of art worth this much money? How is this piece of cardboard with Ted Williams face on it signed by a, with a pen from back then so much money? I can answer it by telling you what Ted Williams meant to people, how old this card is, what the stories took, behind it, the stories behind it, what it took to be preserved this long, and you'll start to find the value. Ultimately, the same arbitrage exists in the metaverse. But when you can see it that way and go, well, you're spending 50%, if not more of your time in this world, the same rules are going to start to apply the same narrative and the same story that is going to elicit this emotional reaction and then in turn make you want to buy it is the same thing that we've been doing in the physical forever. Yeah. Why did board ape work? I don't know. It was the design, the first timing. to market. Good, good story too. Yeah. Good story too. But yep. you know, at the end of the day, if it didn't work, none of us would have been confused and that's the arbitrage. It wasn't a no brainer. Yeah. I mean, how could that be a no brainer? It yeah. was, it, it was just, it's arbitrary, but it worked, you know? And I think, that's actually the beautiful thing about it, because that actually allows everyone to know that you have a chance as an entry point, you know, but you have to ultimately tell the story and create a purpose. I think the purpose is the first line for everything. Like if you can't answer yourself why you're doing anything or why it's important, then it's really not probably going to be received well. Right. And if it's just to make a quick buck, obviously, it you know, you could rip people off, but ultimately it's not going to be lasting either. Yeah. Right. And the thing is you can have a JPEG of it because I could, I took beautiful pictures of every one of those Basquiat's and it has value to me. I, I wouldn't, I, not, not dollar value because I can just delete the photo. Right. At the end of the day, it's not the photo right. and right. that can't be changed. Right. And the only thing now that the metaverse and the blockchain allows you to do is 1 trillion percent confirm that. Because if I said I'm buying this one of one Basquiat and they said it's the only one, I really have to just take their, <laughs> I mean, their documents right. and their word. But in, on the blockchain, I know for a fact that you're not lying to me. And yep. I think that 
it starts to make a lot of sense. And, and that goes to kind of the dynamic between physical and digital because, you know, connecting a physical painting onto the blockchain, I think is interesting. I was telling my son the other day, um, I was taking him to the Sixers game, you know, huge Philly fan, shout out, um, that, he, that when we were growing up, we used to need a physical ticket to get yeah. in. And yeah. if I left without my ticket, I couldn't go. And then yeah. you were able to kind of screenshot a ticket and now you have to add it to your Apple wallet and it's heading more and more towards you have this connection between physical and digital. And I think the sports world is a place, whether it's access to events, access to athletes, um, access to their actual memorabilia, where you're seeing it right now with sports cars, obviously, where they're signed versions, digitally signed versions, physically, and it's all melding together. So I, I think that that is really where a lot of this unlock is going to you know, be present in the years to come. Yeah, I mean, you know, I went to the net game the other day and I, someone that was with me had a ticket. I saw them with a ticket. I looked at this ticket like it was gold because right. I haven't seen an actual ticket in three years. Yep. So all of a sudden I thought to myself, oh shit, if they win tonight, it's a cool ticket. Or right. KD goes for 53, this is a cool ticket. So now all of a sudden, the physical is bringing this incredible value to something that we so quickly just got used to in having a, a, a digital ticket. Yeah, I mean, so, now, yeah, ticket stubs from like Michael Jordan's first game are like going for ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 now. And people used to be throwing them out. You never thought of that. So yeah. imagine you sat on a courtside seat or you sat in a random section and every night you sat in a random section, that group got the physical ticket, that ticket's an NFT. All of a sudden, the value of a paper ticket yeah. And again, because it's the story behind it, which I think yep. is great. So, so this has been amazing. Uh, we covered obviously a lot and we talked a lot about kind of speed of culture, but tell us in this crazy world, what do you actually slow down for? What slows Rich Kleinman down on a day to day basis? Cause you're obviously going nonstop, which I know, but, uh, how, yeah. what do you slow down for? Cause I have like my, uh, like the game time, like I have my time where I've looked at, I'm playing, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And yeah, I, on the field, on the court. And, yeah. And I have a balance because what experience has taught me is, and being, being um, someone that had to wait my turn in some ways, it's taught me that working 24 hours a day, seven days a week actually doesn't work. Um, being the, the killer and needing to step on people and needing to um, get the edge always and win and dominate works, but not with that tone and not that spirit and not that energy anymore. So I'm really somebody that balances my time, spends my time that I'm not working with my family, but I've also, you know, never taken my eye off the pulse. I've never taken my eyes off what was happening, who was young, who was fresh, who's new. And even though I'm with my family and maybe not working, my consumer research is happening 24 hours a day. Yep. My brain Me is too. spinning and thinking of things and being with my family and being balance actually allows me the freedom to see all of this opportunity and to see through all of the like wild day-to-day -day craze and go, oh, okay, cool. I get it. I'm going to do that Monday. If I did it that minute on Saturday, it either A, wouldn't work. B, I may have needed two days to pause and realize, you know what, not a good idea. And that time is, is imperative. But ultimately, yeah. like, you know, we love what we do. So if you love what you do, you're not necessarily ever turned off, but you can rest at times. Yep. Just like an athlete, you need recovery. Yeah. Uh, get ready for the next time you tip off. So um, to wrap things up. So in our last episode, uh, we had Ken Ohashi, who's the CEO of Brooks Brothers. Um, and we asked him what you wanted to know from our Suzy network. And he asked us uh, what post-pandemic trends consumers feel will continue to come true or grow. And what we learned from our Suzy network through that is that um, nearly two thirds of consumers feel that online shopping will continue to dominate over in-person shopping, which to me makes sense because ultimately the one thing consumers can't create more of is time. And I think e-commerce is something that helps over half feel that telemedicine will continue to rise and nearly half feel like online events will continue to dominate um, over in-person events. So I'd love to ask you, Rich, coming out of our conversation today, is there something you'd want to know from our Suzy consumer audience, which we can then cover during the next episode? Um, yeah, actually, that's interesting. I'm going to try this one. Okay. I've been thinking about, because on Boardroom we cover all of these incredible collaborations and all of these brands and crypto exchanges 
and all of these big Fortune 500 companies that partner with creator, partner with um, athlete, artist, brand, uh, you know, smaller niche brand. And they start to create what they think is like cool, exclusive, proprietary content and all of their, um, you know, all of their own collection capsule NFT drop. I would love to know if the consumer thinks it's just all too much. Right. If it would be better if brands built longer equity relationships with their partners, they created a little bit more consistency. I, I just like am starting to feel like as a consumer myself, it's way too overwhelming and it leaves you sometimes consuming very little yeah. because you're actually spending 90% of your time sifting through the weeds. Right. And, um, I wonder if people also feel that way and would love to see a little bit less and a little bit deeper. Got it. So is less more basically is the question yes. succinctly put. Love that. Awesome. Well, we will definitely be asking that during our next episode, sharing the results. So Rich, I just want to thank you for a couple of things. First, I want to thank you for your belief in me and the team at Suzy. Uh, when I came to you, we were literally just launching, um, you know, your name meant and still means so much in the industry. And, you know, you decided to invest in us, gave us and Kevin as well, gave us such sort of like a, a validity as we went to the market. So I just want to thank you for that as we continue to grow. And I know it'll be a great investment for you guys. And just want to say, you know, congrats on all your success and, and continued success in the future. And I'm, I can't wait to see what we can both accomplish together. So thanks so much, Rich. Thanks so much team at Suzy. And on behalf of myself and the team at Adweek as well, want to thank you for joining. Until next time, we'll see you soon on the Speed of Culture podcast. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it, man.